So if there was something I wasn't expecting from the last year, it's becoming a Trekkie. Like, that's for nerds, not chads like me. But after repeatedly hearing two schmucks from Milwaukee gush about Star Trek The Next Generation one too many times... Destroy the set with your one-of-a-kind Star Trek prop! This is what you get for killing Paul Winfield? <laughs> I decided to grab an episode guide and finally give this Star Trek thing an honest try for myself. And after seven seasons of TNG, followed by seven seasons of Deep Space Nine, then three seasons of Lower Decks, a decade's worth of films, and a healthy smattering of other various Trek media, I'm here to declare that one of the most widely regarded science fiction franchises in all of history is pretty neat. Don't condescend me. Now, I'm not taking vacation trips to Vulcan, Alberta, or Duolingo classes in Klingon yet, but I'd say I've consumed enough Star Trek in the last year or so to consider myself a fan, which was surprising to me. For context, when I was younger, I grew up on the lightsaber, laser blasting, spaceship action of Star Wars. So the prospect of watching a bunch of boring old military men spouting sci-fi technobabble with dated, campy special effects wasn't doing it for me. And that's why I was a fucking idiot. I mean, I was right, those aspects are what classic Star Trek is when you boil it down to its most rudimentary elements, but those are also the qualities that help to make it so great. Instead of focusing on action and spectacle, Star Trek is a more contemplative affair. Most of the time. The characters, the ethical philosophies, the cheesy effects. Star Trek is a series about exploring where humanity might go in the future as we traverse what's beyond our galaxy, collaborating with other species and solving problems with wit and tact in order to reach our full potential. As opposed to space magic sword fights and one family's intergalactic drama, Star Trek has adults sitting in a room fiercely debating on if this sentient toaster deserves human rights. They do this twice in TNG, by the way. And learning how much I love that exact type of thing was the moment that Star Trek sunk its claws into me and dropped me into the deepest pits, instilling in me this drive to continue diving even further into this world to see what else was there. And what came out the other side was a far worse person. One where if you even vaguely bring up Star Trek in my presence, there's a decent chance I'll jump into an extended rant about the development of Klingons from TOS into Deep Space Nine, which they then completely change in Discovery, even though that comes before the original series timeline, so it doesn't make sense that they look even more alien from how they did in DS9 when they look like this during their first contact on Enterprise, and see, this is what I'm talking about. That's just what I do now. I've done that to multiple friends. I might have a problem. But then as I was looking up psychiatrists near me, a thought occurred. I have a YouTube channel with a decent I following, so rather than assaulting my friends and acquaintances with opinions about this 30-year-old sci-fi show that I discovered a love for, I could inflict this on a large-scale audience. And some people might even listen to it. So join me, won't you, as we go into the final frontier. To explore what in particular made me fall in love with Star Trek The Next Generation, by extension, Star Trek is a franchise, and why its appeal continues to last to this day. Now, I hate to start a video on a lie, so I do have a bit of a confession to make. Before this most recent deep dive into the series, I actually had attempted to watch TNG a number of times before, but it just never clicked for me, and reflecting on it after finishing the series, it's transparently clear why. Those first episodes are fucking awful. What is that smell? Mm, yes, slightly reminiscent of Night Blooming Throgni, Captain, from home. Quite stimulating, wouldn't you say? No. I say this with little hyperbole, the first season of the series is the worst possible introduction to what many love about TNG and Star Trek as a whole. Looking back at the first season in hindsight of where it went, it feels bizarre to think that this is considered one of television history's greatest sci-fi series. Like, these are the characters I grew to love? This? 
Seriously? This is sex. But I have no place for it in my life now. And that's why this section is titled Getting Into TNG, or alternatively, why you can skip most of season one. Now, to be fair to the opening episodes, the series two-part premiere, Encounter of Farpoint, does an all right job in introducing the main cast that the series will spend the next seven seasons developing, while skimming over a few recurring concepts and interpersonal relationships between this new roster of characters. There's Captain Jean-Luc Picard, who has a lingering guilt having sent Dr. Beverly Crusher's husband on the mission that ultimately killed him. The android Lieutenant Data's Pinocchio-esque, I want to be a real boy aspirations, and Lieutenant Worf acting as the first Klingon to ever serve on a Starfleet ship. This is all a solid foundation to work off of. If it wasn't for the fact the pilot was two unrelated stories forcibly stapled together for the sole reason of making a two hour premiere to fulfill studio mandates. So we're left with half the crew trying to solve the mystery going on at the titular Farpoint station, and the remainder is put on trial for the crimes of humanity by an extra-dimensional god named Q. Thou art notified that thy kind have infiltrated the galaxy too far already. Thou art directed to return to thine own solar system immediately. From a purely writing standpoint, neither of these two stories is bad on paper, and could work as standalone episodes. But there's nothing thematically connecting them, so slapping them together with no thought other than to pad out the runtime brings everything down to like that anime graphic tee sport jacket combo that you insist looks good. Q's Trial of Humanity isn't given the weight and time it needs to work as an exploration of the idea that future humans have grown past their violent nature, ending with an anticlimactic shrug. While the mystery at Farpoint Station feels tacked on, despite being the original story the script was built around. On top of this, none of the new crew gets time to be fleshed out as to why the audience should be invested in future adventures. So ultimately, not a great start to the series, and sadly, it's a while before it gets any better. To their credit though, TNG had a lot to live up to when it first started. In the two decades between the original series being cancelled in 1969 and the premiere of The Next Generation in 1987, Star Trek had become a cultural phenomenon like nothing that had been seen before. For those of you who like going to fan conventions to hang out with friends in uncomfortable cosplay, or star in an impromptu episode of Are You Smarter Than a Redditor as they quiz you on obscure anime facts, Star Trek is at least partially responsible as the fan culture around the series grew into such a phenomenal size that it required regular full-size conventions. Once the series hit regular TV syndication after cancellation, the masses fell in love with Star Trek's hopeful vision of the future. Which is why there was a lot of pressure at the time trying to recapture that lightning in a bottle with the next generation. And it definitely shows in the final product. Not now, Doctor. Please. Between rehashing old material from TOS, clunky dialogue from after school PSAs, and an episode that aged like milk as it was airing, season one isn't bad for any one specific reason, but for a multitude of smaller issues that start to pile up, as the series was struggling to get out from the shadow of its predecessor and discover its own voice. Even removing the comparisons to its predecessor, the better episodes are still plagued with atrociously slow pacing and stilted writing. For example, Heart of Glory, one of the few episodes I'd defend from this season, as it helps to establish Worf as a character and lays the groundwork for how Klingons would be portrayed going forward, takes 15 minutes before the actual plot of the episode gets going. What is this, a YouTube video essay? Despite there being potential for good character development, it's consistently held back by a clear lack of confidence in itself. And what didn't help any of this was that the first year of the Next Generation's production behind the scenes was infamously a disaster. Along with a House of Cards episode playing out backstage amongst the producers and showrunners, the writer's room had to be built with a revolving door due to the creator, Gene Roddenberry, being notoriously difficult to work under and the show's bible being too restrictive to write around. The turnover that first season was 30 writers uh, and staff members left the show. The first season of a TV show with that kind of turnover? By most accounts at the time, the production was an absolute nightmare for everyone involved. 
It was such a mess that one of the main actors, Denise Crosby, bailed partway through just so that she could get off the set because she felt like her character wasn't doing anything, leading to Lieutenant Tasha Yar being hastily killed off before the end of the first season. Cause of death? You know, the classic random tar monster. But we must help them. It wasn't just Crosby either, as she was closely followed by Gates McFadden being forced out of her role as Dr. Beverly Crusher for the second season, due largely to personal issues with the lead writer and showrunner at the time. Eventually, she returned to the role in the third season after yet another wave of production staff replacements saw that particular showrunner removed. Well, it's nice to be together again. But considering the lukewarm reception from audiences when it first aired and the strain it put on the cast and crew itself, it's honestly a surprise that Teen G even survived to make a second season to begin with. I don't think I can overstate how divisive The Next Generation was when it first aired. Diehard Star Trek fans actively hated the new cast members replacing their iconic heroes, critics were extremely mixed on the quality of episodes coming out, hell, even the actors didn't have much faith in what they were signing up for. In the beginning, I thought, I'll do it for the year, it'll never last beyond that. Uh, you can't redo Star Trek, that's ridiculous. Uh, it'll be terrible. Honestly, there's another timeline where this show was axed after the first season and simply remembered as that time they tried to revive Star Trek and it sucked. However, I wouldn't say there weren't good design decisions made in that first year. The Bridge of the Starship Enterprise alone was honestly a genius design from a framing perspective. Putting navigation on each side of the foreground, command in the midground, and tactical high up in the background, all facing towards the camera on a sloped angle, gives the Enterprise's main set this close, comfortable feeling where everyone currently on deck can naturally be framed in a single shot without it seeming forced. I know this is a weird thing to get hung up on starting off, but this is just masterful set design that I've not seen topped in the franchise yet. I mean, yeah, the wall-to-wall -wall carpet and wood paneling on the command council's a bit dated, but come on, it was the late 80s. Everything had wood paneling. Your dog would have had wood paneling. Also, despite it taking a season or two to get through their stilted, awkward phase of figuring out their characters, the casting of the crew itself was exceptional right from the start. Jonathan Frakes gives Riker this roguish charm. Worf was basically made for Michael Dorn, finding this nice balance between a stern rigidness and an underlying warmth as he gradually opens up. And then there's Patrick Stewart. We'll pass all of it. Just another hour or so. You're doing fine. Just hold on. No. This weakness disgusts me. I hate it. I don't think I need to say that if you need someone to give lengthy Shakespearean monologues, Stewart's your man. Being the captain of the new series, and thus the center focus of many stories, multiple episodes culminate with Picard going off on a moralistic speech or huge emotional outburst, giving Stewart the chance to flex his classical theater training. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Almost in direct contrast to Captain Kirk's bold, adventurer persona, Picard is initially played more like a reserved, no-nonsense target manager about to tell you you went over on your break time. And while I could understand why fans of the original series growing up were initially put off by Stewart's blunt seriousness, one early review going so far as to call him a grim, bald crank who would make a better villain, there was clearly something there. I say with total knowledge of where this story goes. To sum up this section, TNG is effectively the poster child for you can't judge a series solely off its first season. Because after a rough start and more than a year's worth of staff changes behind the scenes, including Ron Berry himself taking a less active role due to his declining health, the next generation started to work out some of its kinks as it transitioned into season two. And then... For almost five weeks now, the writers of television dramas, soaps, variety, and other shows have been on strike against producers. For such an iconic series, TNG just could not catch a break early on. On top of all the turnover on the production side, the 1988 Writers Guild of America strike could not have come at a worse time, as it halted all production of season two for a number of months. This led to Paramount Studios dusting off some old scripts they had lying around in the back office, for the sake of kickstarting production once the strike had finally ended. 
most notably one that saw Deanna Troy getting impregnated by a ball of space energy. Saying it out loud, you can understand why this script wasn't being used. If season 1 was a struggle to get through, season 2 would best be described as uneven. It's still weighed down by some of the same issues the previous season had. I have no idea how the Space Irish episode got past the scripting stage. But you can begin to see the potential TNG had start to shine through here. It's no longer a pale imitation of its predecessor. The camera work was improving, the lighting was getting better, sets weren't just a bunch of rocks and foliage on a soundstage. Things were finally coming together. But what really snapped it all into place was when the series shifted away from Alien of the Week plot-centric episodes and started thinking a bit more big picture. That is, using its characters to delve into the philosophical and ethical questions that this series was known for. Commander Data, what are you doing now? I'm taking part in a legal hearing to determine my rights and status. Am I a person or property? And what's at stake? My right to choose. Perhaps my very life. Now for me personally, the moment I started to click with TNG was also the first unanimously agreed upon great episode of the series. That being Season 2's The Measure of a Man. What makes this particular episode stand out is that there's no Romulan plot, the ship isn't going to explode if the crew doesn't figure out some space anomaly, the holodeck isn't freaking out and creating a fully sentient morality from the Sherlock novels. The entirety of the episode is spent debating the question, does Data, an android, have the same human rights as his crew members? When a Starfleet scientist comes around wanting to pick apart Data in hopes of building more synthetic humans like him, Data expresses his discomfort with his request, as there's a chance he could be destroyed in the process, which eventually leads to an entire trial to decide if he has the right to personal autonomy as an android under Starfleet command. I won't spoil what happens or the conclusions they come to for those that want to experience it for themselves, but watching the characters have to grapple with what Data is, and if something that was man-made should have the right to say no to an order it feels is unsafe, is some of the most compelling science fiction I've ever watched. And what adds to the episode, and Data's character going forward, is that this debate on what defines humanity is a metaphysical concept we're still struggling with now. With the ever-growing development of AI technology, there might come a day where we have to define the rights of artificial intelligence. What would separate a fully autonomous android from a human on an ethical level? Could you love an AI being? And most importantly, when will Philadelphia answer for its crimes? And this is just one of a multitude of philosophical or ethical thought experiments the series delves into. Just skimming over my personal favorites list, there's Darmok, which is all about the nuances of linguistics and communication. Chain of Command is centered around the cruelty of torture interrogations. The Offspring questions the relationship between parent and child. And Sarek shows the struggles of facing the changes that come with old age, i.e. when you hit 30. These are all stories that tackle some of the toughest questions and ideas that humanity faces to this day. You could write entire books about the philosophies presented in Star Trek. In fact, they have. This one's actually pretty good, I'd recommend it. And this focus on exploring humanity's potential in the future through morality plays has always been at the heart of the franchise. The original Star Trek was largely inspired by Gene Roddenberry's firm belief in humanism. That being the philosophy that humans could meet their full potential and solve most of their worldly problems through logic and reason as opposed to theism or tribalistic beliefs. That's why Star Trek exists in a future where humanity has gotten over its petty problems like greed, racism, and using Wojaks to argue politics on Twitter. In a time where sci-fi futures were built on how terrible things would be if we don't mend our ways, this was a story that said there was a better future in store for us. We finally made it, and there's a whole galaxy to explore from that point on. But things had changed since the 1960s. In planning out the sequel, Ron Barry and his writers were well aware of how drastically the world had changed since the first series. The original Star Trek broke a lot of boundaries during its initial airing, but the change they represented in the 60s had gradually shifted to being the norm. So if they wanted to keep to the spirit of Star Trek's philosophy, 
they would have to re-examine the world it was being made in. To quote Roddenberry in a 1978 interview with Starlog magazine, The audience is certainly more sophisticated and able to reach their minds out further. The audience is ready for statements on sex, religion, politics, and so on, which we never would have dared to make before. And in his guide to the Star Trek writers working on TNG, Roddenberry stated, We will use science fiction to make comments on today, but today is now a dozen years later than the first Star Trek. Humanity faces many new questions and puzzles which were not obvious back in the 1960s, all of them suggesting new stories and themes. Despite Roddenberry's waning health and eventual passing during the series' fifth season, this outlook helped throughout the next generation's entire run, shaping how the show would continue to write its stories and address the philosophical questions it would bring up. But beyond the themes of its episodes, what I appreciate about how TNG handles these queries is that they aren't always perfectly clean-cut morals, and are often left open for the characters and audience to interrogate what they feel is right. As a prime example, one of the core tenets of Starfleet is the Prime Directive, a guiding principle that Starfleet officers can't interfere in the natural development of any society, especially any that haven't reached warp drive capabilities, even if it's a life or death matter. This directive is essentially there to keep Starfleet from going planet to planet, providing undeveloped cultures with spacefaring technology and photon torpedoes before they've even mastered the VCR. We will help you build defenses, build facilities. We have no defenses, Captain, nor are any needed. <laughs> Clearly, it's not always followed or enforced in the strict sense, but that's actually what's interesting about how TNG handles this guiding tenant. The Prime Directive is inherently vague and open to interpretation, so that there's wiggle room for it to be debated and understood, leading to a multitude of great stories revolving around just that. While it was originally written as a cheeky way for Roddenberry to subtweet about the US invasion of Vietnam in the 1960s, the Prime Directive is an interesting device for writing stories in this universe. Characters can't drop down guns blazing whenever they stop by a new planet and see a problem they feel needs to be addressed. There has to be thought and consideration in how their actions might affect the inhabitants. Even the idea of how first contact with a new planet that has reached warp drive capabilities is handled with extreme delicacy because it could have such lasting ramifications on its citizens that might not be prepared for what's beyond their galaxy. Or maybe too prepared in some cases? I've always wanted to make love with an alien. Some of you relate too much to this character. At face value, the Prime Directive has a noble goal. Avoid disrupting the natural development of societies by forcing Starfleet's own technology or ethics onto them. A pretty agreeable idea. Let planets develop as they naturally would. There's a number of ways that interfering with the culture's organic process could go wrong. Early on in Season 3, the episode Who Watches the Watchers is solely dedicated to explaining here's exactly why we don't interfere with developing worlds, when a Starfleet surveillance of a primitive civilization goes horribly wrong, leading to a fanatical religion nearly being formed as a group of Bronze Age proto-Vulcans come to believe Picard is an all-powerful god due to their lack of scientific understanding to explain the Enterprise's technology. Not like this one. It must mean something. But Picard is angry with us. Picard then has to do everything he possibly can to keep the people from killing in his name, up to putting his own life on the line to make sure an unfounded religion doesn't take hold and set the entire civilization back. Overall, a pretty decent argument on why you don't drop in on a planet that might not be ready for it. But then on the flip side, you have an episode where a planet is in danger of exploding due to a naturally occurring disaster, and Data has to debate with Picard on if they step in to save the pre-warp inhabitants below, because whether it's a noble cause or not, it's directly interfering in the world's natural progress, which technically goes against Starfleet's golden rule. Sure, today it's just stopping a natural disaster from wiping out millions, but then the next, it might be a man-made disaster, then it's an evil dictator, and then a world-ending civil war, slippery slope argument, etc, etc. It's moments like this that demonstrate how the Prime Directive creates this ethical catch-22. Interfere with other alien civilizations as if you know what's best for them, and change the entire trajectory of their culture, 
or don't act at all and be a dick about it. Where's the line between enforcing colonialist attitudes and being indifferent to other sufferings just because they don't meet a specific technological criteria? More often than not, the Enterprise does help those in need when it's called for, but the crew treats it as the serious ethical question that it warrants. What a perfectly vicious little circle. Granted, this might sound dry to some, but that's the thing. TNG isn't intended to be an action series, despite what the movies might lead you to believe. The moments you look forward to aren't Riker punching out a Klingon like he's Rambo, it's characters sitting around a room arguing the ethical dilemmas they're faced with. In fact, a majority of the time, the drama or action of an episode is trying to avoid getting into epic space battles. TNG is about circumventing war rather than engaging in it. Just as the original series was created to reflect the Cold and Vietnam Wars of the time, TNG was made near the end of the Cold War as global politics were starting to move towards a less outwardly hostile mindset, and the shifting relations between nations were reflected in how the show handles its various alien forces. For example, the Klingons, who were the Soviet Union allegory that acted as the main antagonists of the Federation in TOS, are now tenuous allies, and the current recurring antagonists, the Romulans, have been signed into a shaky peace treaty with the Federation, with multiple episodes and storylines focused on navigating these agreements without allowing the Romulans to freely overstep their political boundaries. Instead of blaster fights and explosions being the heart of the action, TNG's drama is often rooted in how the Enterprise avoids causing diplomatic fuck-ups that could potentially drag them into another war which I think is a far more engaging way to write its stories. But then you have the Borg, who create an interesting wrinkle in that intention. Understand you? You're nothing to him. He's not interested in your life form. You see, when designing an antagonist, an important consideration is making them idealistically contrast the protagonists. You want something that goes against the main character's own morals and goals, so that there's a natural conflict between them. So, in the case of the Borg, there's no real diplomatic approach that can be taken with them like the Romulans or Klingons. They're a hive mind collective of cyborgs traveling in a colossal cube through space with the sole intention of assimilating all other life forms. There's no sense of morality or humanity or concern for survival to speak to. It's the sci fi equivalent of negotiating with a beehive. As they say, Resistance is futile. Now, on the surface, the Borg might read as a boring, high-tech version of zombies, but rather than every future encounter with the Collective being another space battle, this is a chance to stress the ideals of the main characters. When the Enterprise discovers a lone Borg drone lost on a planet after one of their cubes crashed, they're presented with the issue of what to do with it. Picard is ready to plant a virus in it and send it back into the Collective with a pat on the ass so that it can crash the Borg systems once it's reintegrated, killing them off once and for all. But the rest of the crew is less enthusiastic about the plan the more time they spend with the subject, especially once the drone starts to show individuality after being separated from the Hive. This raises the question, can you justify the genocide of an entire race for the arguable greater good, knowing that there's still people deep down? It's all well and good when you can finger wag about how murder is wrong, but another to practice what you preach in the face of a tough moral dilemma that would have lives on the line. So our main characters are pressured to really interrogate their own morals in this situation. And this is just one of dozens of alien beings and cultures that the Enterprise encounters through their space tour that they have to find unique ways of handling. It might not sound that interesting laid out like that, but it's great to have a series that's about overcoming the challenges of understanding other beings and finding common ground, even when it's not always convenient. However, I wouldn't be doing Star Trek or The Next Generation justice if I only talked about its serious, high-minded philosophies. Because what keeps it all grounded is that good old late 80s, early 90s sci-fi cheese. The masculine and the feminine. It is the way in which we propagate our species. Please demonstrate how this is accomplished. In the same way that I created a list of favorite episodes, I felt I also needed to make a secondary list of guilty pleasure episodes. Because while they might not have the narrative impact of the finale or the emotional rawness of inner light, I can't ignore a storyline where the crew travel through time to 19th century San Francisco and have Mark Twain assist in stopping an evil alien plot. 
eavesdropping is by no means a proper activity for a gentleman. Nonetheless, the deed is done. Something I've noticed in the last year is that if you talk with Star Trek fans long enough, the conversation will inevitably derail into everyone reminiscing over their favorite absurd storylines that they remember. Like, remember that one time everyone on the Enterprise started devolving into primitive species and Worf sprayed Dr. Crusher in the face with acid? Open your mouth. <laughs> Classic. TNG walks a fine line of delving into weighty, philosophical subjects handled with reverence without taking itself too seriously at all times, which can be a tough road to walk. With every season having at least 22 40-minute episodes dedicated to them, statistically speaking, not all of them are going to be instant classics that revolutionize the sci-fi genre. Some of them are just going to be a bit silly. And that's completely fine. I know I just spent the last 15 minutes philosophizing on the ethics of Star Trek, but the other side of this franchise is the inherent cheesiness built into its DNA. One of Star Trek's most iconic scenes is one where William Shatner fistfights a man in a lizard costume with all the grace of a 2009 YouTube skit. So you have to be willing to meet it halfway in terms of suspension of disbelief. If you can't get over every other alien species being an actor put into some mild face prosthetics, who can speak perfect English despite it being their first time they've encountered humans, or the idea that the holodeck can project entire worlds while still existing in a small square room of a starship, you're probably not gonna have a great time. But if you can accept these aspects as they are, it's a fun ride. With science fiction, part of the experience is letting yourself believe in the logic of the world as long as the story does, even if it's transparently goofy if you think about it for more than two seconds. Or in the words of the scenic art supervisor of the series, Michael Okuda, You pick a style, you pick a particular color palette, a particular way of shooting things, a particular way of doing your visual effects, a particular way of telling your stories, and that becomes your style. And once you've defined that, if you've defined it well, if you believe in it, if your stories believe in it, the audience will buy into it. Being made in the far off past of cable TV, the limited use of special effects and CGI gives the show a sort of stage play feeling. And I don't say that dismissively. Due to the limitations of the time, the set and prop designers had to find clever ways to bring you into this world resulting in this ever-present mix of charm and creativity. For example, the fact that this shot is done entirely with practical effects and a full-scale model using hydraulics, or the photon torpedoes used in nearly every episode were just a mylar pom-pom, shows how much ingenuity had to go into these scenes. Watching through the DVD extras, it's fascinating listening to how the production staff did some of these effects with nothing but a bowling ball and some salt. But then you also have this divine being represented by a man in a white morph suit with a glowing effect overlaid on top. Clearly, decisions had to be made when it came to where the budget went. While Star Trek's massive cultural influence meant it had enough cash to keep Patrick Stewart's head waxed and shiny for decades, TNG was still a syndicated sci-fi TV series in the 80s that had to film 26 episodes a year, meaning productions had to be quick, and budgets were spread thin across all departments, unless it was a big episode like a season finale that required entirely new sets to be built. That's why one episode will have the crew running around as they attempt to figure out why the Enterprise is stuck in a time loop that resets when they collide with another starship, repeatedly ending in an explosion, all with Cheers guest star Kelsey Grammer, and then the next episode has a barrel heavy enough to shatter a Klingon spine into dust look like... This might be the common writer slash wrestling fan in me talking, but I much prefer a show that has to find creative ways to work through production limitations over something that just has a higher CGI budget. I don't want to sound like a hipster fan with something that I only just discovered a love for a little over a year ago, but there's definitely a quality to Star Trek that was lost once budgets grew and CGI was better able to fill in the gaps. This isn't even a jab at modern Star Trek specifically. You can see this change occur even during TNG's transition from TV to the films that followed. Now obviously, on a purely technical level, this is better. 
There's production value, dynamic camera angles, cleaner, consistent sound quality where lines don't have to be redone in post because they're recorded in a hallway as the actors walk through their scene. The production crew clearly wanted to elevate TNG to the level of movie quality once they transitioned to the films and had the budget for it. Assimilate this. But it's missing that, dare I say, soul that the next generation had in that late 80s scuffed TV production where all the navigation consoles were held up on Apple crates. Is it really TNG without... This is also where I have to give credit to the main actors going along with whatever the script throws at them. The cast makes such an earnest attempt to make up for what the technology couldn't that brings an extremely human charm to what could have been a stilted sci-fi series if not handled as well as it was. Seeing all the actors have to violently shake themselves whenever the Enterprise is hit by an outside force is constantly entertaining once you notice it. Especially when you can tell they aren't all on the same pantomiming wavelength for how much energy they need to put in. Just look at Jonathan Frakes violently rocking his hair like he's holding on for dear life, as Stuart lightly sways in the opposite direction, and Michael Dorn is barely phased standing right behind them. This shot will never fail to make me laugh. It's not only the cheesy qualities of the series that makes it fun to watch though, because TNG is also just genuinely funny. I protest, I am not a merry man. The cast is clearly aware of how ridiculous some scenarios they have to act through are, and are fully willing to lean into those qualities when it's called for. You can't tell me both Brent Spiner and Michael Dorn, who have to sit through the literal hours of makeup to get in character, didn't enjoy the chance to dress up in cowboy gear and film their own Sergio Leone spaghetti western. Counselor, I would appreciate some support in this matter. Durango. I'm called Durango. Yes, uh... Counselor Durango. There's a degree of self-aware camp to the series that's just hard not to love, and no one knows their way to maximize the camp quite like Q. Now after the middling response to the first episode when the omnipotent god was introduced, it would not have been a shock if we never saw this character again. Just silently sweep him under the rug and move on. But fortunately, the writers and actors saw the potential Q had along with John Delancey's performance, so they chose to keep him around as a recurring character. Thus, every season we get an episode where Q, seemingly bored with absolute power over all reality, comes around to toy with the crew of the Enterprise. Especially his favorite, Jean-Luc Picard. These are some of the best episodes when it comes down to pure entertainment value as Q's whimsically chaotic nature has a natural chemistry with Picard's stoic, no fun allowed demeanor that makes for an amusing dynamic as they play off each other. And slowly with each encounter, we see how they start to rub off on each other, leading to a begrudging friendship and some very specific fan fictions. Morning, darling. Since there's no real limits to his power or where he can go, the franchise would continue to try to use Q in the next couple series after seeing how popular he became, matching him up with the other leading captains. But they could just never capture that same witty repartee he had with Picard. They wanted to find him a new love interest, but he just couldn't get over his old boyfriend. I assume you're the Q I've heard so much about. Have you heard about little me? Oh, do tell. Has Jean-Luc been whispering about me behind my back? What really made the relationship work, though, was gradually seeing Q go from a malicious, uncaring god ready to send humanity back to where they came from, to someone that seems to relish spending time with Captain Picard, even going so far as to find ways to save him in his most dire moments. I find it hard to believe that you are doing this for the benefit of my soul. Well, now that you've shuffled off the mortal coil, we're free to spend a little time together. Above all else, what ultimately bridges TNG's cheesy sci-fi goodness and the philosophical ponderings together is its characters. Picard, Riker, Data, Worf, Crusher, even minor ones like Deanna Troy's mother or Miles O'Brien, the officer in charge of the transporter. This series is filled with characters that all have their moments to shine throughout this seven season journey. But what truly surprised me most was how attached I got to them. 
I can't count the number of times that a scene from The Next Generation had me gripping my heart like an octogenarian who lost their medication as I watch these characters overcome some of the toughest hardships as they explore the open galaxy. Let's make sure that history never forgets the name Enterprise. For a great example, one of the most iconic episodes of the series is the two-part season three finale, Best of Both Worlds, where the Borg attempt an invasion on Earth after capturing and assimilating Picard, forcing the Enterprise crew to face the reality they will have to fight against and possibly kill their own captain for the greater good. For many, this is the moment TNG truly came into its own within the Star Trek franchise, giving us arguably one of the greatest season cliffhangers of all time, and something the series would spend the next three years trying to top. But what stood out to me personally on my initial watching was actually the direct follow-up to these episodes, titled Family. Along with B stories about Worf being embarrassed by his human foster parents coming to visit him and Wesley sorting through the belongings of his deceased father, this is the episode where Picard deals with the trauma of being assimilated by the Borg in the previous episodes, heading to his family's vineyard in France as a way to clear his head. Throughout the episode, Picard wavers between deciding if he'll return to Starfleet, where he'll have to deal with the emotional aftermath of being assimilated, or avoid it by staying on Earth for a deep sea research project. In the end though, it's his estranged brother who forces him to face the truth. And after a bit of mud wrestling, Picard finally lets his guard down, leading to this incredibly vulnerable moment. I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't good enough. I shouldn't have been able to stop. I shouldn't. Not gonna lie, that scene gets me every time. This is a moment where that disgruntled target manager from season one, who's defined by a sense of control and composure, has to come to terms with a traumatic event where everything about who he is was stolen from him, and there's nothing he could do to stop it something he would have to carry for years, no matter where he goes. That encounter with the Borg wasn't a one-off adventure that shrugged off after the credits roll. It's something many characters would be scarred by. The reason I bring this up is that I believe that episode, and this scene in particular, exemplifies what Star Trek is at its best. That being using science fiction to tell deeply human stories. Remove all the warp drives and alien forehead ridges, and Star Trek's greatest strength at its core has to do with empathetically portraying genuinely human problems. And if you'll indulge me a little further, there are two characters that demonstrate this better than any others that I want to talk about. Starting with... Nearly everyone we follow on the Enterprise is perfect. Sure, they have a couple of flaws or stumbling points when they need to learn a lesson that episode, like Geordi's tragic lack of game or Worf's insane death wish getting in the way of being a good father, but for the most part, the cast that TNG focuses on are perfectly self-actualized people who are at the top of their field as decorated senior officers of Starfleet's flagship. You have the chief medical officer, the chief of engineering, the first officer, the captain, and then there's Lieutenant Reginald Endicott Barkley III. And what instantly separates Barkley from the rest of the crew is that he's the exact opposite of everything I just described. I don't see anything wrong with you at all. Wait a minute. There is a slight imbalance in your K3 cell count. My K3s? Oh, Barkley, no, no. I'm sure it's nothing. Barkley is neurotic. He stumbles over his words and generally causes those around him to feel uncomfortable due to his awkward struggles with communication. Compared to the Enterprise's senior staff that exudes confidence in their work, Barkley comes off as if it's his first day on the job. After three seasons of Picard's diplomatic trek throughout the stars, Barkley is not remotely what you'd come to expect from a Starfleet officer. 
In fact, it's heavily implied the only reason he made it onto the Enterprise is that the captain of his previous assignment wanted to punt him off since there was nothing to fire him over. Anyone not familiar with Star Trek or TNG would be forgiven if they assumed Barkley was a nothing loser character at first glance and moving on. And yet, he's one of my all-time favorites in this entire franchise. But let's rewind a bit. In his introduction, Barkley is found living out the dream of every person who's ever had an imaginary argument in the shower by simulating one on the holodeck. Picard has a problem with me. You tell him to come and talk to me himself. Failing to connect with others at his new engineering post on the Enterprise, Berkeley finds solace in the ship's top-of-the-line simulation room. But like a teenager who just found 4chan, Berkeley gets addicted to the holodeck because it's easier to interact with simulated holograms than real people. He's able to act with complete confidence when surrounded by his perfectly crafted simulations, but as soon as he's put in a real-life situation, he completely crumbles due to his anxiety, which results in him struggling to do his job, creating a constant cycle of relying on the holodeck for social gratification whenever he fails to get along with his peers. This one episode says a lot. Not just about how using escapist power fantasies can quickly become a crutch from actual human interactions, but the way we treat those with social anxiety disorders, intentionally or otherwise. Barkley, well, he's always late. The man's nervous. Nobody wants to be around this guy. If I felt that nobody wanted to be around me, I'd probably be late and nervous too. That one line hit like a truck when I first heard it. Because rarely does a series not only take the side of the awkward shy guy in such a direct, empathetic way, but really try to understand it. It can be easy to write off someone who's a bit weird in social settings, but how often is it that we reflect on how our attitudes toward them may feed into that? The thing is, Barkley is a genuinely skilled engineer that ends up frequently proving his value on the Enterprise, but is initially alienated because of his inability to communicate well with those around himself. You're just shy, Barkley. Just shy. Sounds like nothing serious, doesn't it? You can't know. Yet, as the series goes on, the senior staff actually begins to respect his work and opinion. After Berkeley comes to them with concerns there are creatures in the transporter, which he initially passes off as psychosis from his fear of teleporting, the senior staff takes his word for it and makes actual steps to address the issue. And while there are initial hurdles in their relationship, it's so endearing watching Jordy, Barkley's immediate supervisor who was prepared to fire his new subordinate just to get him out of the way, gradually make the effort to involve Barkley in missions to bring him out of his shell. Commander? Yeah, Reg. Thanks for um, assigning me to this mission. Don't mention it. Extra credit also has to go to Dwight Schultz, who does a fantastic job in the role, notably during the episode Nth Degree, where Barkley's hit by a burst of energy from an alien probe, causing him to become incomprehensibly intelligent, to the point he isn't even recognizable as the same person. Throughout the episode, Schultz has to present himself as the nervous wreck he's shown as in past episodes, but then progressively add layers of confidence and then narcissism to the character as Barkley's transformed by the effects of the probe until he turns himself into the Riddler from Batman Forever. Barkley only has three episodes dedicated to him specifically in TNG. Still, every one of them is exceptional, both in establishing his character and exploring social disorders like anxiety and phobias in this type of setting. What's great about Barkley is that he's not used as a way to look down on those that have difficulties with social anxieties, an easy slip up a show like this could make for its time, but instead makes genuine attempts to humanize a person with these kind of adversities, even going so far as to make him the hero from time to time. Barkley's entire arc throughout TNG is about finding confidence in himself and his abilities, and as someone who constantly questions his own self-worth in social settings, that's pretty damn relatable. Social anxiety isn't something that magically clears up after one person reaches out. 
So it's great that Star Trek took the approach of having a character that has to work with it, along with coworkers who try their best to support him in his efforts. That's the beauty of Star Trek when you really get down to it. But if I'm going to talk about the humanity of Star Trek's characters, I have to tell you about my absolute favorite. Congratulations, you are fully dilated to 10 centimeters. You may now give birth. All right, this is where I'll be giving everyone the option of an exit ramp if they'd like to leave. In short, Star Trek The Next Generation, good. Star Trek, good. Go watch it. But this is the point where I'm going to go on an extended tangent about how neat I think Worf is. For however long it takes for the meds to kick in, even if it disrupts the entire flow of the video. So, as I alluded to earlier, something I personally found refreshing about Star Trek is the way alien races have their own unique culture, separate from humans, that affect how the Enterprise crew are meant to interact with them. Even though most of them are framed around taking a single human quality and supercharging it. The Ferengi are hyper-capitalists, the Romulans are militaristic, the Borgs are robotic hive mind with a singular aim to assimilate all sentient life, and the Trills develop a symbiotic relationship with slugs that intertwine with their host personality like a white guy discovering rock climbing. But the race that gets the most development in TNG by far is the Klingons. Looking back at the original series, Klingons were never really written as anything more than a bronzed Soviet Union allegory, mainly existing to be the antagonist for the Federation in stories related to war. They were then developed further with the Star Trek films, where larger production budgets allowed for better detailed prosthetics, before TNG came along to put a bigger spotlight on the actual culture of this warrior race. Going from OG to TNG, Klingons went from a generic, tyrannical military force and transformed into an amalgamation of stereotypical ancient Viking and samurai customs, mixed together with the aesthetics of your local leather king shop. A lot of effort was put into making Klingons their own identifiable culture beyond being the generic bad guys they were being lumped into in the original series, even going so far as to design their own unique cultural weapons. I'm used to doing battles with swords and rapiers and sabers and foils and sticks and clubs and axes. And suddenly uh, Dan Curry at a production meeting said, hey, I got this design of uh, this thing called a bat lift. And I looked at the design and I'm like under my breath, I'm going like, this, this, this is not gonna be good. But if I'm being honest, I'm not that invested in the actual Klingon culture in specific. The desire for honorable battle, the weapons, the mating rituals, are all cool aesthetics that resulted in some fun characters over the years. But what I actually care about is how Worf relates to it all. I am a Klingon! If you doubt it, a demonstration can be arranged! Now, if I had to pick a top favorite character in the series, it would have been easy to go with Picard or Data, as they get the lion's share of development in terms of iconic episodes. But when I really think about it, there's just something about Worf in particular that I find fascinating. Being the first Klingon to ever become a Starfleet officer, and one who was raised by humans after losing his parents to a surprise attack by the Romulans, Worf is defined by a complicated identity crisis, wanting to best represent his family's culture while living in an entirely different world separated by it. After decades of wanting to finally experience what it means to be a Klingon with others like him, when Worf's actually able to meet and interact with his own species, there's this ever-present disconnect. Learning about his heritage solely through books on Klingon culture he was able to access on Earth, Worf has an idealized version of Klingons that he pursues that is often in conflict with how most Klingons actually act, usually just wanting to get drunk, fight, and sing songs about past battles. Worf sees being a Klingon as an honorable warrior with a noble history, where the reality is most Klingon soldiers act either like drunken frat bros who just finished watching Fight Club squabbling over who's the most alpha male, or radical terrorists with a death wish. As the series goes on, the more apparent it is that Worf is desperate to connect to his people, but the feeling isn't exactly mutual, as he's often looked down on by other Klingons for choosing to work under the Federation over fighting for the Klingon Empire. The Empire might have made peace with the Federation, but that doesn't mean working under them is suddenly admirable. Oh, love and peace, we don't murder those that insult us. How are you going to die in glorious combat like that? In fact, when a notable member of the Klingon High Council was discovered to have had a traitorous father that sold out to the Romulans, 
They attempt to use Worf as a sacrificial lamb because they assume he wouldn't bother to defend his honor if it was pinned on his father instead, since he's so busy with Starfleet. But they underestimate how much this man loves honor. However, after a whole trial and multiple assassination attempts to keep the truth under wraps, Worf begrudgingly accepts a discommendation, meaning his name would be tarnished across the entire empire. As he found it to be the only way to keep the peace within the High Council, and protect the brother he had recently discovered. Though he doesn't leave without getting in one of the most satisfying backhands to ever be put on film. Yeah. Because of their conflicting nature, Worf is regularly forced to choose between his duties as Starfleet officer, something he holds in extremely high regard as a noble position, and the responsibility he believes he has to the Klingon Empire as a Klingon even if they continuously shit all over him. He might not always be respected by the others for how he chooses to conduct himself, but Worf still strives to be the best Klingon he can be by his own merits, and wants to see the rest of his people thriving too. That's probably why he continually finds himself at the heart of the Empire's most defining moments, for one reason or another. At one point, Worf meets effectively the Jesus of his religion, and then is hit with a crisis of faith as he has to face the problem of how it could revolutionize the entire Klingon political system. Especially once it's revealed that it's actually a clone of the aforementioned Messiah, which adds a whole extra layer of complications. In a way, Worf feels like he's pulled from a Shakespearean tragedy with how often he's dragged into Klingon Empire power struggles. But if all that wasn't enough, there's also Worf's son, Alexander. That's right, not only is Worf balancing the complicated relationship between being a regular and historic Klingon events and living under a human upbringing, but handling it alongside being a single parent. Now, I'm aware that fans of the series hate this character, and I get it. I have not lied. Alexander, do not continue She's to- She's lying. She hates me. That's why she makes up stories about me. Trust me, I get it. But despite all the grating whining and general child acting, Alexander is an important facet to Worf's character. After yet another Klingon High Council conspiracy, Worf's former lover Kalar ends up being killed. And once he takes care of a quick revenge murder, Worf is left with a son he didn't know he had to take care of. So now on top of having to grapple with his own relationship with his estranged culture, Worf also has to attempt to impart those teachings to his child that isn't entirely interested. You don't care about me. That is not true. All you care about is your honor. Alex. This is what I was getting at earlier when I said Michael Dorn was made for this role. That one expression is the perfect, fuck he got me there. But eventually, after multiple failed attempts to connect with Alexander, Worf realizes it's far better for his son to choose the path he wants to take, rather than forcing him to become a Klingon warrior like him. Worf discovered what he wanted to do on his own, so his son should make that decision for himself too. Maybe I'm just a sucker for parents learning to accept their kids for who they are, but it's really sweet seeing that side of a hard-edged character like Worf. And this is just one stop on Worf's wacky family adventure. The man also has his full Klingon brother, an adopted brother that works for Starfleet, the kid he adopted as his brother after their mom died, his Belarusian foster parents, and that's all without getting into the complications added in Deep Space Nine with the trills and being adopted into another Klingon house. In this entire franchise, I don't think there's anyone that's had a more complicated life than Worf. Between juggling his family drama and his own challenges with the Klingon Empire, it feels like Worf gets tossed around the whole galaxy, both metaphorically and literally. Yeah, the tough thing about being one of the strongest characters on the roster is that when the writers need to prove a threat is real, you gotta be the one to take the hit. But even though he might get his ass beat so consistently that he had an entire trope named after him, Worf doesn't give up. He stands by his convictions and what he feels is correct, no matter how many times he's knocked down or thrown around. He's quite literally trying his best. Throughout his journey, Worf has to face continued trials to test who he is deep down as a person. And ultimately, what we learn is that he isn't a Klingon. He isn't a human. He's just Worf. 
So while I could point to his warrior spirit or his never-ending thirst for honor, there's so much more to why Worf is a compelling character. The idea of struggling with self-identity is a nigh-universal one, especially anyone who's found themselves growing up in a place separate from their cultural background. Because you want to feel like you fit in, but that can be challenging without worrying that you're disregarding your other culture. He might be alien, but Worf deals with these incredibly human problems, from the struggles of being a single dad to, should I murder this child? Which creates this multifaceted character that is far more nuanced than the memes would lead you to believe. Worf is a fascinating portrait of someone looking for his place in the universe, as he's continually made to feel like he doesn't belong. But in TNG, he gradually finds a family among the Enterprise crew that fully accepts him for who he is, while still allowing him to explore his identity as a Klingon, whether that's doing tea ceremonies or celebrating Klingon rituals. He doesn't often show how much he cares, but after the Enterprise crew eventually go their separate ways at the end of the movies, and Worf is transferred to Deep Space Nine for an assignment, he doesn't entirely know what he's meant to do in Starfleet without his family. He finally found his place in the world. It will not be the same. The Enterprise I knew is gone. Those were good years. And I could do one of these character breakdowns for pretty much any of the main cast. Picard's constant fight for diplomatic peace, Riker's self-doubt in his career choices, Data going through his own can I pull off a beard phase. All these characters have so much depth to them when you really dig into it. Okay, well, except for Troy. Sorry, Marina Sirtis. But hey, at least you'll always have gargoyles. Very well then. If you are not my ally, then you are my enemy. And with that, we come to the end of this journey. You just don't get it, do you, Jean-Luc? The trial never ends. The ultimate irony of Star Trek The Next Generation, the series that opened on one of the worst premieres of the franchise, is that it concludes with the greatest finale ever. As TNG draws to a close, we watch as Picard is given one final test by Q. A space anomaly is slowly collapsing across time, and Picard has to work through his past, present, and future self to keep it from destroying all of humanity. And as the episode goes on, we see how far the Enterprise crew has come since their first mission, and how far they all still have to go as they eventually go their separate ways to pursue their own careers. Honestly, as simple as it sounds, this is just a beautiful note to send the series off on, highlighting how much one's personal growth is shaped by those around them by showing the crew on their first assignment as Picard took over command, where they are seven years later after hundreds of missions together, and where they all go 25 years later. I don't think there's a better way they could have represented how you need to cherish the time you have with your friends while they're still around, because all good things must come to an end eventually. For extra emphasis, they even took the opportunity to bring back Denise Crosby as Tasha Yar after all these years. That's such a little detail that goes so far to show the consideration that went into how they'd send off the series. But the true stroke of genius was how the finale was tied into the anticlimactic trial of the premiere episode. You see, Q's trial of humanity didn't just fizzle out at the end of the pilot, it never ended. Q had been testing humanity's supposed potential for growth ever since the start of the first season. And I gotta say, whoever came up with that idea in the writer's room deserves the Nobel Prize and a giant smooch on the lips, because it's brilliant. Not just because it brings the series full circle with a nice little bow on it, but because that's the final lesson of TNG. The trial is never over. We don't reach a certain level of technological advancement and then stop growing. Just because we can travel through space doesn't prove anything about how far we've come to understand the universe around us. Beyond exploring other worlds, the next step to humanity's development is fully exploring our own perceptions of ourselves and our realities. The ultimate takeaway of the series is there's always the potential to expand our horizons beyond our own perceptions. And it doesn't have to be solving some grand time paradox either. It could be as simple as taking that second shot on a show you didn't think you'd like, or maybe that hobby you were hesitant about trying, or just taking the chance to join your friend's poker game you'd been missing out on all these years. Truly, the sky's the limit. <laughs>